today to welcome our friend Reverend Daniel O'Connell back with us today. It's a, a really a pleasure that he comes and speaks to us on a regular basis. Just briefly, I will um, just mention his 20 plus years career in the ministry serving churches in Danbury, Connecticut, St. Louis, Missouri, and Houston, Texas, and um, that he is a co-founder of the UU Voice for Justice, a rapid response social justice network. We're glad to have you with us today. Welcome. Good morning. It is good to be back with you it's here a month ago, and that was a wonderful time as well. So the theme for March is transformation. I was talking with Rachel before the service about how some transformations are long, and I think the um, older I get anyway, the more I can see some of the transformations that I went through, and and I think I tend to to notice or remember the ones that were more dramatic, um, even if they weren't as important. Um, and so I want to start us off with something. This is called um, The Lamb. Saw a lamb being born. Saw the shepherd chase and grab a big U and dump her on her side. Saw him rub some stuff from a bottle on his hand. Saw him bend and reach in. Heard two cries from the U, two sharp, quick cries like high grunts. Saw him pull out a slack white package. Saw him lay it out on the ground. Saw him kneel and take his teeth to the cord. Saw him slap the package around. Saw it not move. Saw him bend and put his mouth to it and blow doing this calmly, half kneeling. So I'm slapping around some more. Saw my mother watching this. Saw Angela. Saw Peter. Saw Mimi with a baby in her belly. Saw them standing in a row by the big stone wall in the wind. Saw the package move. Saw it was stained with red and yellow. Saw the shepherd wipe red hands on the used wool. Heard other sheep in the meadow calling out. Saw the package shake its head. Saw it try to stand. Saw it nearly succeed. Saw it have to sit and think about it a bit. Saw a new creature's first moments of thinking. Felt the chill blow through me. Heard the shepherd say, good day for lambing. Wind dries them out. Saw the package start to stand. Get halfway, kneeling. Saw it push upward, stagger, push, and make it. Stand, standing, saw it. Surely was a lamb. A lamb saw a lamb being born. That is transformation. We get to experience, we get to be a witness there of real-time transformation. Being born, dying are ultimately a religious experience. Not only for the person it's happening to, but for the friends and family around them. A lamb is being born, and this birthing, like all birthings, there is no pause button, there's no fast forward, there's no rewind. All we can do is experience reality as it unfolds at its pace. The lamb comes out slack, not moving, the shepherd is methodical, he slaps the lamb, no response, he opens his own mouth and breathes his own breath into the nose and mouth of the just-born lamb. How will this turn out? You cannot know in the moment. 
as far as I know, most people don't get to choose the day that they're born or the day that they're going to die. Sometimes we don't get to choose whether we're going to transform or not. All we get to really choose, if we've prepared, is our attitude towards what is unfolding in real time. About 30 years, 30 years ago, I was a traveling computer salesman. And I made many business trips to destinations all over the United States. And on one cross-country business flight, I stepped through a one-way door and realized I could never go back. This particular trip was right around now, in the spring. I was traveling from west to east coast, a whole variety of cities. I was going to be gone for about two weeks. And then back. And then there were high winds as we were coming into um, Norfolk, Virginia. And the plane was so heavy before takeoff that they actually asked people to get off the plane. I was, of course, way in the back, and I was thinking about it, but by then two people had scooped up the travel vouchers and off they went. So on the way into Norfolk, Virginia, remember I'd been flying from the West Coast, so long flight, nonstop, Norfolk, Virginia, we ran into bad turbulence trying to land. Well, we were about 4,000 feet up, and the winds were rough, buffeting the plane as if it were being jostled by a crowd. And strangely, the turbulence began to take on this episodic quality. It would be really turbulent, and then it would stop. We kept descending. There's clouds all around, so we couldn't see anything. And it gets worse and worse, and then there would be calm. It's like, okay, this is over now. Well, no. And then it got really, really bad, and it seemed like the plane was in a fist fight with the wind, and the plane was losing, and the wings were literally flapping, and the racks of overhead racked open and stuff flying around inside the cabin and people began to exclaim whoops and oh my and it became obvious that the plane was losing and it's that point that I got scared because there were some women at the front of the plane and they started singing Amazing Grace. Okay, well, this has just taken on a level of realism that I don't particularly enjoy at this point. And I was gripped with an utter incapacitating terror. I was in a state of panic. I could not pull that seatbelt hard enough. And the turbulence got worse. People's arms and legs were flailing about. Some were crying. Others were praying. I was in an aisle seat. The lady in the next aisle seat had tears streaming her mascara down her face as she's looking at pictures of her grandchildren. And all I could think of, because I grew up Unitarian Universalist, and of course I was an atheist because my dad was an atheist, but all I could think of was, please God, I don't want to die. <laughs> I wasn't ready. I was not enlightened. I was not awake. I was not aware. I had no real purpose in my life at that point, mid-20-something. Now, it was all going to end painfully, badly. When you're in, in that experience, there is no pause button, there is no rewind, there is no fast forward, there is no turning to the next chapter. All we can do is experience unfolding reality at its own pace, at its own transformative so, of course, we landed safely, or I wouldn't be here, and everybody on that plane, absolutely silent. No one spoke a word. No one made any noise whatsoever. It was the quietest group of people getting off a plane I've ever heard. And somehow I found myself in the rental car parking lot with my luggage. And I look up. The storm had passed. I smell honeysuckle. I hear the buzzing of bees. I feel the cool breeze on my face. And it was as if my whole life, up until that point, had been half asleep. But now, now I was awake and aware and ready to make changes to my life like never before. 
And I suddenly felt the truth of George Bernard Shaw saying, life is not about finding yourself. Life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. What could I create? I was motivated, I was awake, I was aware, I was ready to find a purpose in my life. I suppose I had not really been ready before because I thought there was no particular urgency in me finding my path. After all, my path, whatever it's going to be, it's got to be really important, so therefore I better really think about it, so I better take my time, right? Well, that brush with what felt like near death, that lit a fire under me. And I knew in a way that I had not known before, that everything that lives will someday die, and that this included me. I mean, I knew this intellectually. I'd gotten the dead bird theology you know, my Unitarian church growing up. But now I knew something that this was going to also affect me. Did you ever have a day where you realized death was close? Maybe somebody in your family, maybe even to you, and you realize, oh, oh. One day, this is going to happen to me, too. So I knew that death happened, but that day I realized that not only would death come for me at some point, I would never probably ever know when that someday would be for me until it was there all of a sudden. And there is no pause button. There is no rewind. There is no fast forward. So it occurred to me that if I was ever going to matter to another person, if I was ever going to matter to myself, I had to undergo a transformation. When? Yeah. In that rental car parking lot outside of the Norfolk, Virginia airport, that was my day to get started. Now, in the back of my mind, I knew I could just rationalize away what had just happened. I could ignore its implications for how life is uncertain. I could have tried to continue living the way I had always lived. But a tidal wave had borne me up, given me a new perspective. And I knew that if I were to take a giant step towards self-transformation, I had to ride this wave. Not ignore it, not rationalize it away, but just ride it on in. To try and take the energy it brought to help move me, to whatever the next big thing in my life was going to be. I had no idea what it was going to be at that moment. I just knew that I was determined to find out and I was determined to seize the day, to take the opportunity when it came, not wait for some future day when I might be ready. This was new to me. It is not, however, a new idea. In the fourth act of Julius Caesar, Shakespeare has Brutus say these words, There is a tide in the affairs of men. There's a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune, omitted, and all the voyages of their lives are bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or we lose our ventures. So not only do the tides have great power, but they are also irretrievable, unstoppable. You cannot call them back. Their lifting strength comes for a few hours and is gone. And if you miss the flood, you'll be left in shallows and in miseries. I think there are tides in our spiritual development too. You can catch them. It can be scary, but significant growth and learning can be yours. Miss them, and you will feel like you just missed something big. The hot breath of the spirit of life is unpredictable. We know certain kinds of suffering can lead to breaking out into new life, but only if we catch the tide when it comes, not when we're ready. It may seem that we are caught unawares one day, and then, oh, suddenly, right now, in fact, we have to decide something big one way or another. And, of course, the temptation will be to say, well, if this is too hard, there's too much choice. I don't have enough time. And sometimes it does take our own suffering to reconsider our life's path. We know there are singular opportunities, and they only come once in our lifetime. Years ago, a probe, Pioneer 11, was launched to take pictures of the planet Jupiter, that mysterious planet Jupiter with the big red eye. 
500 million miles away from the sun. It takes 12 Earth years to complete its own one-year journey, and it is a mysterious planet. It, at the moment, has 95 moons. 20 years ago, it had 63 moons. They're still counting the moons. For more than two years, Pioneer 11 was traveling toward Jupiter, and then there came a time of closest approximation. And in those moments, the cameras aboard that vehicle sent back extraordinary pictures. And having completed its task, that vehicle continued on into space, and never again will it get anywhere near Jupiter, ever. There are times in our lives where we come very close to a major spiritual development in our own lives or a major contribution to a social justice effort. And the hot breath of sudden spiritual change is all about us. And in that time of closest approximation, we can claim a new destiny. We can claim a transformation. If we are awake and aware and ready, the tide of life can lift us up to create something new. There is a tide in the affairs of men and women which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune, mist, and we are left in shallows and miseries. We don't know when we, you and I, will be called to live up to our principles. What about that one we just heard? The inherent worth and dignity of every person. We don't know when we might be called to live up to that. We don't know when a sudden opportunity for transformation is going to present itself and whether we will be awake, aware, and ready. Once upon a time, there was a hot summer night. I was the on-call chaplain at the Rush St. Luke's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. It's about 3,000 beds. They had a death about every 24 hours. I had a <clears throat> white lab coat, a pager, in a very small room, caught really in a chaplain's office. And when that pager sounded, it usually meant that someone had died and that you, as chaplain, were being called to comfort the family and sign some forms because it's a hospital. Your job was to join total strangers who found themselves in the tide over their heads. People you had never met before and might never meet again. On this particular evening, around 5 o'clock, during an evening rush hour, the pager went off. I scurried over to find a small hospital room with seven much larger people than me in it, and one small woman in a bed. She was only 64, but she was dying of ovarian cancer right there in that bed. Her blood pressure had been going down for hours, a few beats per minute down, and then down again, and didn't look like she actually had that much time left. Her husband was there, her four grown children, two sisters. There was no pause button, no rewind, no fast forward. All we could do is experience reality unfolding on its own terms. It turns out that they had called the Roman Catholic priests in to do the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. It's also called the last rites. But the, peace, the priest had not yet arrived, apparently stuck in traffic, and they didn't think he was going to get there in time. So please, the eldest daughter said to me, please, would you do the ritual? Well, in as gentle a tone as I could, I told her that I was a Unitarian Universalist ministry student. And she said, well, we all believe in the same God, don't we? <laughs> and I knew she did not want a theological conversation. She wanted me to transform into the minister that she and her family needed to be in that moment, right then and there. We talk about coincidences. 
It turns out that our class of chaplains had learned the Catholic ritual of anointing that sick that very day, in fact, three hours earlier. And I had, in fact, the very card in my lab coat pocket from that workshop. And I had grown silent for a moment, thinking this through, and I looked up, and the whole family and a nurse, they were all looking right at me. And I found myself saying, yes. And no sooner was that word out of my mouth than a nurse pressed a small jar of mineral water in my hand, and I found myself asking the family to circle around the woman's bed, and I began the litany with my card, and they knew all the words. They didn't need a little card. They knew all the words. They knew how to respond. And I remembered that the Catholic doctrine, which we had learned three hours earlier that day, says that the ritual is efficacious, meaning it works, even if the priest is corrupt. So <laughs> I took some comfort in that. And we did the ritual, and obviously it helped them, it helped me. The tide was lifting, and everyone knew it. Sometimes things happen in a room full of strangers, and no explanation is needed. There's a level of trust, and everyone feels like they know what's going on. It provides a certain kind of spiritual intimacy. And I drew two interwining circles with my fingertip dipped in oil on her forehead, and then across, and we finished the litany, and all of a sudden, the woman in the bed suddenly opened her eyes, briefly looking right at us, and her eyes closed, and she let out a longer breath, and of course we all froze, waiting to hear that inhale again. And then it came, and then another, and then another, and then a semblance of normalcy returned. And we all kind of moved into our corners of the hospital room, finding our own space to stand and consider. The day turned into night, and about 7 p.m., I came by again, and the real priest was there. I was startled because he looked so young, and I was also worried about what he would say to me for what I had done. But he thanked me, and he was gone in five minutes. And around midnight, my pager went off again, and this time it was the same phone number from the same nurse's station, and I went back, and the youngest son, who was probably six and a half feet tall, was very upset. The rest of the family had been trying to calm him down, they couldn't do it, so they called me, and I could sense that the tide was nearing its crest. And the family and I talked for a few minutes in hushed tones, and we were all quiet. And then for some inexplicable reason, we all turned to look at the bed at the same time, and in that moment, she stopped breathing. And after a moment of recognition, the youngest son began wailing, and without saying much, we all rode that tide together. And the tides came, and they took that woman away, and we were awake, we were aware, we were as ready as we were going to be. Don't miss the tide which comes in your life and gives you the opportunity to serve. My charge to you today is to seek a way, find a way in the next seven days, between now and next Sunday, to create an opportunity for transformation. Maybe transformation inside, maybe outside, maybe side by side. An inside transformation will be to do something personal, to finally take that first step or to finally take that next step to do something significant for your life so that you feel that sense of meaning and purpose and much less a sense of regret. An outside transformation might be to join others to improve social justice or welfare or go volunteer among any of those opportunities you just heard this morning. Because when you do something like that, not only are you helping outside transformation, you are also transforming yourself. And then there's a side-by-side -side transformation this might be the easiest or the most difficult of all, to reach out to somebody, an old family member or an old friend you haven't been in touch with a while, 
for old lang syne, as they say. You know as well as I do, 12 months from now, a year from today, someone that you know will no longer be with us. They will either have gone from this earth, or they will have moved far beyond where you can reach them. Perhaps there is someone on your mind right now. Someone you feel you should speak to. A word of encouragement that you could bring them. A word of truth. A word of witness. A word of apology. Don't miss your opportunity when it knocks on your door. Don't forsake the tide which might be arriving for you at this very moment. When the opportunity does come, you may be a bit flummoxed. Maybe you realize the enormity of it. Maybe you have to sit and think about it a bit. Still, you can stand, you can stagger, push, keep going, keep going. This is how transformation works. Keep going and succeed or fall down and get up again and surely Surely something new in you will be born. May it be so, and amen.